we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to uh, welcome our colleague, colleague uh, Hikaru Madeira. Um, uh, you, you've heard his voice, but uh, thank you very much, Hikaru, for, for joining us. And uh, uh, Martin, of course, is here. Um, I think we're expecting a couple more people, but our intention today is to, uh, first of all, have Martin and Ricardo talk a little bit about racial inequalities in Brazil and the United States. Uh, but our agenda for the meeting is not simply to review the evidence, but also to talk about uh, the current political moment and uh, what that implies both for our research and for uh, education policy in the two countries. So we'll start with data, but the conversation, as I say, is not uh, about data. I think, you know, it, it's, it's always helpful to have evidence, but uh, the urgency of the moment, I think, also requires a discussion, a broader discussion of um, what this means for our practice as educators and as, as scholars. So uh, with that, uh, with your concurrence, Martin, I'll ask Ricardo to begin, um, talk a little bit about Brazil, uh, you know, and, and Ricardo, let's keep it relatively brief. Um, we'll then move to Martin, same advice to you, Martin, and then- uh, Well, we're, we're starting the other way. You, you're starting the other way? Yeah, I'm going to go first and record. So I'm not in charge. I just... Uh, no, no, uh, before you came on, we... <laughs> okay, no, I don't mind. I don't care. Okay, Mark. Well, it's, Martin, I, it's just that Ricardo's stuff is, is much more detailed. Okay. Mine, so. All right. Okay, so, so we'll start with Martin, uh, move to uh, uh, Ricardo, and then uh, we'll open the floor at that point. Okay. Hi, everybody. We're going to be joined by uh, Eric Adams, Abrams and Prudence Carter at 1030. Uh, to go more into the discussion of the, as what David said, the importance of the, what's going on now and what implications this has for us in terms of the way we do our work. So I'm going to just start with a very brief review of um, uh, basically economic inequalities. Uh, and I just want to start by saying that uh, racism and racial inequality has, they, these have many dimensions, many dimensions. And um, I think I would refer you to a very important op-ed piece in the New York Times yesterday um, uh, that talks about, because uh, this is a good intro to my stuff, uh, talks about the fact that it's very difficult to separate racial inequality from um, social and economic uh, inequality more generally. And uh, the way that uh, um, capitalism pits um, and historically has pitted um, whites and people of color against each other um, in order to divide the working class. Sorry for such a radical uh, start, but uh, this, this op-ed piece, as of yesterday, uh, makes, I think makes this ultra clear and it, history can't be denied. So with that introduction, let me just say that despite all these dimensions of uh, racism, racial inequality, economic and educational aspects of unequal treatment are very important, very important. Um, uh, so if you're an African American living in the US or Brazil, you're much more likely to be poor, not have a regular job and earn lower income uh, than uh, uh, if you're white in the same country. And this has important impacts on African Americans in terms of their health, ability to confront even small economic downturns and very important, their ability to accumulate wealth. Uh, and there are other factors that have made it very difficult for them to accumulate wealth, such as segregated, segregation, redlining on housing, et cetera. But the fact is that it starts with make the, these earnings differences make it very difficult for African-Americans to accumulate wealth relative to whites. So I just wanna review very quickly some of the characteristics of African-American education earnings inequality in the two countries. 
and what the possible relationship is between the two of these. The, uh, the educational attainment gap, which is the number of years of schooling between African Americans and whites in both Brazil and US is significant, but it has closed over time in both countries. It closed uh, somewhat earlier uh, in the US than in Brazil, but the fact is that in terms of educational attainment, and it's slightly larger in Brazil, it's somewhat larger in Brazil than in the US, but that has to do mainly with the difference in the average levels. Uh, the gaps, it's, you hit a top once you get and start a high percentage of people getting university at some form of post-secondary so that the gap, the attainment gap shrinks. Uh, so there are many estimates of African-American earnings differences uh, in both countries, African-American white earning differences. And it's important to differentiate between males and females when you do this analysis. So educational differences explain a considerable part of these earnings differences. Keep that in mind. So Lamb's early 2000s estimates in 1999-2000 show that even controlling for education differences, employed US uh, African American men earn about 15% less than white men and Brazilian African American men earn about 26% less than whites is controlling for educational levels. Uh, and mestizo men earn 18% less. Um, now, what's interesting is that the differences for females of LAM, LAM estimates are practically zero in the US controlling for education differences, but not in Brazil. They're about the same as for men. Um, and then uh, Bailey et al. in 2014, estimated that both Petos and Pavlos earn about 20% less than whites controlling for covariates. That's for uh, 2002. Um, and in Brazil, um, well, I just said that. So um, now what's interesting is that Ferreira, Ferreira that's Francisco Ferreira at the World Bank and Firpo uh, and, uh, and Messina, I think is the third author, uh, show that this difference fell uh, in Brazil, this difference between um, uh, uh, pretos and whites fell uh, significantly from about 18% in 1995-96 um, to about 9% again controlling for education. So in Brazil, the differences are falling. For education, so in Brazil, the differences are falling. Uh, and in this same period, however, in the US, there's no evidence that they did fall. Um, so it appears uh, that there are some difference in the estimates of race earnings differences, depends on how you classify race. And there's a very interesting article, this Bailey et al. article, which has six different classification, how, how race is classified in the census by self-identification, through pictures, people looking at pictures of people and saying, is this person uh, black or white, uh, uh, African American or white, and they, they, show, they show you the pictures that they use to classify people. And there are four other ways to estimate. And just these, these do make some differences in the way the earnings differences show up, depending how you about how people are classified. Uh, in the US, it's self all these data are based on self-identification and to the large part in, in Brazil also. Um, so how do these differences uh, vary across income levels? That's pretty interesting, e education and income levels. In the US, it appears that in uh, uh, recent years, uh, African-American men have low earnings gap at higher education income levels than at lower levels or at median incomes, lower education levels or median incomes. This is a, a recent article in 2017. Um, however, however, these estimates are based on all African-American men, not just those with earnings, not those just, just those in the labor force. And they do this quite specifically because there's a very high non-participation rate of African-American men. And of course, this varies across uh, education and income levels. There are a very high percentage of African-American men are incarcerated in the US. So they're 
not in the labor market, not officially anyway. Um, uh, but the opposite seems to be true in Brazil, uh, at least back in 2002. But this is for income earners in which the gap is larger at the highest uh, income levels in the 10th decile. It's significantly larger in the 10th decile than it is across most other deciles. Um, this may have changed uh, since 2002. Um, so one would think that decreasing gaps in educational attainment would have a major effect on earnings differences between the two groups. And in fact, it does have some impact in certain historical periods in the US in the late 1960s and the 70s. Uh, this, uh, I did a, a book back in 94 called Faded um, uh, Dreams, in which I estimated from, the 19, from 1940 uh, up until 1990, uh, what were the uh, reasons the gaps changed or didn't change. Uh, and uh, more recently, Bayer et al. in 2017 did a similar um, estimate for the US. And in Brazil, uh, this per Ferreira Furpo Messina article shows that between 1995 and 2012, um, uh, this difference, uh, uh, that there was some relationship between uh, education to, uh, to um, the declining race gap. Um, but it's unclear uh, uh, how much that is. They contest some of the stuff done by uh, um, uh, uh, Pius de Vado, uh, which claims that most of the income inequality was reduced by, by higher education. Um, other, other work also disagrees with the Pius de Vado analysis. So you, you would think that one contribution, even for getting about educational attainment, is the fact that um, maybe if this was offset by the fact that African Americans um, have much lower um, test scores than um, uh, white Americans. And the same thing is true in Brazil. Uh, there's in, in the US, African Americans score about a half a standard deviation to 0 0.6 standard deviations lower on math tests, controlling to some extent for SES. Um, uh, this on the eighth grade math test. On the eighth grade reading test, it's about 0.4 to 0.5 standard deviations. This is in 2013. Um, uh, this is in a paper that I did with uh, Emma Garcia at EPI. And uh, the gaps uh, in the Pueblo of Brazil are very similar, uh, 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 but uncorrected for SES differences. Uh, they're about the same, 0.5 to 0.6 in 2011. Um, and on reading for about 0.4. Um, so it's possible that these test score gaps are related to earnings gaps, but there's little evidence that the decline, by the way, in both the US and Brazil, this, er, this uh, test score gaps are declining over time. Um, and, and, but there's very little evidence that this decline has contributed in any way to increasing a decreasing gap in earnings differences. Rather, and this and I will conclude now, rather there is strong evidence that the biggest impacts on race earnings differences over time not, do not come from education policies, do not come from this reduced gap in attainment or even reducing the test score gap, but rather uh, from government policies or external economic trends that impact lower income earners relative to higher income earners. Why? Because a very high percentage of African Americans in both Brazil and uh, US are in the lower strata of earnings. So anything that affects the bottom, either positively or negatively, has a much greater impact on African-Americans than they do on whites. So, uh, but the same thing true for females. But so things like minimum wage policy, false familia, lower unemployment rates, 
shifts to formal employment from informal employment in Brazil, uh, growth of high paying manufacturing jobs for blacks in the 60s and 70s, for example, uh, taxation spending policies in general, civil rights movements, which um, have some impact on uh, access to better education, et cetera. Um, if that happens to coincide with, the, with education policy, when it happens to coincide with incomes policies in the same period, has, a, has a, an effect of reducing earnings differences. If the two things are going in opposite directions, incomes policies are much more important than education policies. They easily offset. So for example, Bayer et al. estimate that because of the increased inequality of incomes in the United States during the period 1979 to, to now, the fact is that blacks have been hurt by that despite their increasing educational attainment. There's no effect on decreasing earnings gaps between blacks and whites, except at the highest income levels. At the highest income levels, which have gotten, if you happen to be lucky enough to be an Amer African American with a college, completed college education and happen to be in this highest decile of income, you have closed the gap on whites. But in the rest of the distribution, that's not true. Uh, and Brazil has the same kind of thing in the early 2000s, that because of the declining income inequality in general, because of other factors um, that had nothing to do with educational attainment, the fact that blacks were moving up in educational attainment uh, helped. You can see this another way by saying, what happens to the rates of return? In, Martin, uh, I apologize for interrupting. Is it 10 minutes already? It's already been 10 minutes, so, so okay. I hope you're- um, This is it, this okay. is it. I just wanna say that watch the rates of return to things like the higher versus lower levels of education. Because when they're declining, like in Brazil, then African-American earnings differences uh, uh, are equalized. And if they're going up, like in the US, the opposite happens, because you must be in that highest education level in order to get a, the advantage of that in terms of earnings. Thank you. Okay, Ricardo. Oh, you're muted right now. And thank you, Martin, that was great. So, Ricardo, you're still on mute. So, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, okay, yeah. now you're fine. So, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, so what I'm doing today here is I'm going to bring you some data on some stuff that Martin said. I'm going to try to uh, to put some attention on some more detailed uh, information about uh, where these gaps are coming from. So the, if you can, you know, if we can, when we control for differences in socioeconomic background, uh, how much of these gaps are, are actually reduced. And I'm also going to bring some evidence on some recent stuff that I'm doing that are looking to connection between a data on K-12 education and data on formal labor market, and also on uh, differences uh, across social emotional skills. And right? so, Ricardo, I'm, just, I'm just going to interrupt and say, and you're going to do all of this in about 10 or 12 minutes, right? Uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, the last stuff I'm going to, uh, okay. I'm going to, 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 you know, this is going to be for the uh, discussion. Good. The, the part on parts, right? So I, I think that I'll be able. I'm going to be very quick on the data, right? So let's start like looking a little bit on Brazilian uh, social uh, background and racial background. So as everybody knows here, right? Uh, we have, uh, you know, mobility across generations in Brazil is very low. So this is 
some data that shows how much it takes for the lower income families to reach the mean income families in terms of generation. So this is showing that Brazil across all these countries, the 29 countries that are here, Brazil is the 27. So Brazilian mobility is very low. And as Martin said, since the blacks are overrepresented at the lower uh, distribution of earnings, you know, they are actually, they suffer a lot with the uh, mobility. Uh, this is just some uh, gaps in terms of access uh, to infrastructure and also, uh, you know, durable assets like home ownership, water network, sewer system, trash collection, electricity. So this is all data from the population of census. So as you can see, you know, the, uh, the red bars are blacks and the white bars are the whites. They're like all differences gaps uh, for all this assets and infrastructure access. And here I'm showing differences in earnings. Uh, so these are adults looking to the census 2000. So in the left in the left hand side we have women, in the right hand side we have men. So as you can see, you know, the white distribution are seated to the right uh, in comparison to the black distribution of earnings uh, that go for women and also for men. So these are just uh, trends in terms of uh, you know earnings in the left hand side. So uh, as you can see, you know the, the dashed line is the whites and the uh, red line is blacks. So there is like a huge difference. The difference, the gap is closing a little bit. You know, up here I'm going to 2010. So we keep going on this. I mean, you're going to see that there is a slight reducing uh, reduction in the gap between. Uh, uh, blacks and, and whites. And here I'm looking, I, I'm uh, looking at to, uh, unemployment rates, right? This is all, uh, uh, so this is, you know, uh, household surveys. So this comes from Pinagi. So these are unemployment rates trends in Pinagi. As, as we can see, as Martin said, you know, there is also a gap uh, between blacks and whites in terms of uh, employment, you know. The, the blacks, the white, the, the blacks are, are lagging behind in terms of uh, employment rates. So let's take a look here on uh, so just uh, on education attainment. So as Martin said, in the last years, so this is adult population who is 35 years old. Uh, this is data again, Pinagi from 90s to 2010. So as you can see, there is like a slight. Uh, you know, a slight evidence that the gap is closing. This has been increasing in the last years since like you have democratized the access to basic education in the last 20 years. Uh, but still, you know, there is like a, a significant difference in terms of uh, educational attainment. So now, uh, you know, we are controlling for, uh, so that, that's a way of control for education. So now we are seeing earnings, distribution of earnings for uh, different groups of uh, education. So here on the up and left side, I have the uneducated uh, blacks and whites. As you can see, you know, again, the whites are uh, seated on the right. Uh, when you go to the complete primary education, again, we see like a, a significant difference between blacks and whites in terms of the uh, differences uh, in distribution of earnings. And then when you look to complete elementary, again, we still see the differences. And when we go to complete high schools, which are the higher high paying jobs, the difference is still higher uh, between uh, blacks and, and whites. So this is something new that I'm doing. Uh, I'm crossing here high data, you know, the formal labor market in Brazil, uh, with, with uh, data on K-12 education in the state of Sao Paulo. So what's nice about this merge of data is that that allow me to uh, control uh, for um, test scores at the end of the K-12. So the SARESP data uh, is so all the students here are doing SARESP at the end of the K-12 system, at the end of the high school. And so when I merge these two data, I can control uh, for the, these differences uh, in the SARESP data, which are basically standardized test scores in math and in reading, right? So when I look to the model one, this is the unconditional differences 
in terms of uh, earnings. So as I can see here, there is like uh, differences for the blacks and for the browns, right? And then when I go from the left to the right, I go to the more uh, uncontrolled model to the more controlled model. So I'm, I'm adding controls as I go from the left to the right. So as I can see, when I start like including uh, data uh, controls from, uh, from education, from students that are in the same school and students that have the same I standardized test scores in SARESP, there is like a significant decline in the size of the gap. The gap is still there, and this is everything that happens now. This is due to everything that happens after the uh, kids leave the K-12 system. So college access is an issue here, right? So the students finish their education because many of them are going to college. Uh, so this is just controlling for uh, test scores by the end of the K-12. Uh, and this can, uh, this accounts for about 50% of the size of the gap for men. And when we look to women, you know, again, uh, this accounts for about 50% of, between 50 and 60% of the gap. So now let's look a little bit to what happens in terms of school progression, the gaps in, in terms of school progression. So this is administrative data from the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, so here in the first uh, panel, what I'm putting here is kids that were uh, in the second grade in 2007, and I can follow, uh, I have like administrative data in panel, so I can follow these kids over time, so I can see where they go, right, over time. So for instance, in 2007, all the kids are in the second grade, then in 2008, I know how many kids were retained in the second grade and how many kids were actually promoted to the third grade and so on. So in the first panel here I have the whites and in the second panel here I have the blacks, right? So I would expect it, you know, if they are progressing as they are expected to, what should happen is that, you know, they should keep going on the diagonal, right? They should follow the diagonal. So everybody that's under the diagonal is actually lagging behind, staying behind. So what I can see here when I compare, you know, so these are kids that were like, uh, that were in the second grade in 2007. So in 2011, if they were like progressing as expected, they should be in the sixth grade. So 81% of the whites, they are actually in the, they reach into, they reach the sixth grade uh, in 2011 and only 70%, 74% of the blacks reach uh, the sixth grade uh, in 2011. So there is a gap here of 7% in terms of uh, school uh, progression, right? So I, I can do the same exercise now looking for kids that were uh, in the eighth grade in 2007, right? So it's the same exercise and I find a gap even bigger here, right? So uh, among the kids that were in the eighth grade in 2007, 62% uh, of the whites they reach at the 12th grade, which, the last, which is the last grade of the, of the high school, and only 51% of the blacks, so the gap here is about 11%. Right. So, so now this is uh, evidence on some stuff that Martin mentioned. So uh, this is uh, data on uh, test scores. This is math proficiency in terms of Z scores. It's, this is always standardized. So one here means one standard deviation, point one here uh, means like 10% of standard deviation and, and so on, right? So these are gaps measured in different uh, grades uh, in the K-12 system. So the first model here is just the raw difference between blacks and, and whites without any controls, right? So the second model here, the dashed one here, I'm adding controls for uh, socioeconomic status uh, of the families, right? So there is a significant decrease in the gap when I control for socioeconomic status. But then when I go, when I go from the dashed line to the, you know, the gray line, I'm adding controls for school. So these are all blacks and, and whites that are like uh, in the same schools, right? So they are actually, uh, uh, progressing the same school. And all the population here, you know, uh, are people that actually, students that actually reach 
the last grade of the K-12 system, right? So, of course, I'm, I mean, I'm being more generous here with the Blacks because many of them are actually living, as I show you, they are living the system uh, uh, along the way, right? The dropout rates for the Blacks are much higher. So as you can see, you know, that this is very sad, actually. We have like an initial gap of about 10% uh, of uh, standard deviation, and that keeps until the end, right? So the school is not, is not being able uh, to uh, close these gaps. And this is huge. This is about seven, uh, seven months of education, the, the difference between uh, blacks and, and, and whites. So, Ricardo, just just a warning. We're we're at ten minutes now. So, oh, we are ten minutes. Yes. Okay. So, just, can I show just one more thing? Yes, one more thing would be great. Okay. So, okay. So, this is you know uh, now I'm showing you if there is some evidence of discrimination in school, right? So, I'm looking to comparing grades of prof of teachers assigned by teachers and here standardized tests, right? So, as you can see. Uh, whites, you know, doesn't matter, you know, uh, how much whites are performing, how well whites are, are performing in standardized tasks, they are always, they are always performing better with teachers than with, uh, uh, than with, uh, than blacks, right? So when I perform like a controlled, when I, compor I, I perform a controlled experiment here, controlling for uh, test scores, and look for differences in terms of the grades assigned by teachers, then what we see here uh, is that the gap reduces. So when I go from the left to the right, they go from the less control to the more control. So there is a reduction in the gap, but the gap still persists. So even when I control for the school with the, uh, uh, social economic status or some behavior information that I have from the students from their transcripts, I still find some uh, significant difference between blacks and whites. So this is like some evidence that there is some sort of racial stigma going on uh, in, uh, in the, at least in the Sao Paulo schools. So this is, of course, is very worrisome. And our evidence, I'm not going to show here, but our evidence uh, suggests that this racial stigma is connected to the idea of uh, statistical discrimination. Because these gaps are only pre uh, they are on they are only present for teachers uh, that had no experience with the black kid before. So if the teachers had already taught those students in the past, we don't find those differences there. So you know, so if they know better the kids, the gaps are not there, which is consistent with the idea of statistical discrimination. So I'm going to stop here, and then I can come back uh, along the discussion. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And I, I want to take a moment to introduce our colleague, uh, uh, Prudence Carter, who has joined us. Uh, Prudence was, our, uh, was a professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford for uh, many years and abandoned us for, uh, uh, to become the dean at uh, University of California, Berkeley, in the Graduate School of Education there. Um, and you know, has very generously agreed to join us this morning. Uh, Prudence, Martin uh, and Ricardo have uh, spent the last 20 minutes sort of presenting some data on racial inequality in uh, the US and Brazil. And, you know, sort of unsurprisingly, the data show dramatic gaps uh, between white and black students and white and black adults in both countries. Um, but the context for our conversation today is the data are simply a starting point that particularly in this uh, moment, uh, we feel like we need a, a larger conversation about what the data mean for us, both as educators and as scholars, um, and how we can move beyond simple data analysis to address these gaps in a more uh, active and positive way. So I, I don't know if you would like to introduce yourself and, and make a few remarks, or if you'd like us to continue our conversation and you can pitch in as you like, but I certainly would uh, welcome you to the floor if you'd like to at least introduce yourself. Well, thank you, David, and good, and good morning, good afternoon to you all. Um, <clears throat> I am sorry that I'm late. I had to attend another event at my, own, my school. Um, most of you don't know me, so, so let me just give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm a sociologist of education. 
Uh, most of my work is in inequality of education, particularly through the lenses of race, class, and gender. I've done comparative analysis um, in the U.S. and South Africa, mostly with some attention to Brazil. I, I was able to speak to an audience. Um, Martin brought me down to the Lemon Center uh, event a few, uh, probably about seven years ago. I've been away now for about uh, four um, at Berkeley. But I think about inequality in a multidimensional way um, through the institution of education. And I think about particularly um, how inequality manifests at the intersections of racial and, and class inequality. And as I'm listening, I have only been on a few minutes, so I can't uh, say much, but I've also been in a conversation this morning with colleagues about the intersections of data science and education. And the first thing that comes to my mind, a paper I've just submitted and written with a colleague at the University of Amsterdam, is the extent to which we as educational researchers, inequality researchers, can really capture institutional and systemic forms of inequality. And specifically, I'm gonna speak about anti-Black racism um, in this context. And the reason I raise that is because many of you may be familiar with the large data set in the analysis of the economist Raj Chetty and his colleagues, Nathan Hendren and others uh, at, at, at Harvard. But one of the things that uh, I have been doing in the last several years is just thinking about, and I was a commentator on one of his papers on a lecture he gave at Princeton some years ago, and as I delved into his work, one of the things that I could not um, in any way stop thinking about, and this was a headline, a sensational headline in the world's global paper, the New York Times, was the fact that while they control for everything around the kind of material or resource context, they still found a, ma a significant race effect even among the most affluent Blacks in their study, and particularly Black men. They didn't find it for women, but they found it for Black men. And one of the things that I've engaged with him around is the extent to which big data studies can actually aptly capture what institutional uh, racism does um, to the academic and overall social, um, uh, physical, the overall well-being of people. And so this is where I am right now, in the moment where most of us are being conscientized to think about systemic and institutional forms of inequality, specifically racism, how do we capture it? It is so intangible and it is so variable across context that perhaps we need to think about more investment in um, the development of valid measures around that. So that's my first point. Because there's, a, there's this unexplained variance, as we can see in these gap analysis that we do. Um, and we don't, you know, we can infer that it's about some things. I mean, some people take the opposite. So, well, we've controlled for everything. The ones who are not necessarily sensitive to race may infer something genetic or biological when we know race is not a biological category. There are others of us who may be more mindful of the systemic and institutional. But one of the big questions I've been wrestling with is how do we capture it in the data? Um, and so the multidimensionality is really important. The second thing is that I think it is important also for us to figure out how to do these multi-level analysis um, in ways that can capture the kind of interactional uh, relationships. Uh, learning and education, in my opinion, is not just about the technical or the imparting of um, knowledge around math, sciences, the social uh, studies and stuff. It is also about the deeply political, social, and cultural realities of students and teachers and educators in the classrooms. We don't necessarily, as someone who does ethnographic work in schools, I have observed a lot of very problematic uh, interactions across both uh, contexts in the U.S. and South Africa in both affluent and working class affluent schools. And the most startling thing that I've been able to see in my own research um, is the extent to which, in my data, um, students who come from historically minoritized, racially mi minoritized and working class backgrounds, when you compare them to students um, of the same similar social position in different schooling contexts, and the contexts that are more culturally and um, racially sensitive, where there is more uh, egalitarian practices, those students' social psychological outcomes are very different from their peers in the more affluent schools where 
Um, they may have better material resources, better teacher quality, but the social psychological outcomes are not the same. And interestingly enough, we see in the data, in a number of studies that I have reviewed and even in my own, we can see significant uh, between group differences uh, within race. Um, so that the idea that if we put students who are historically minoritized in better schools, meaning if they go to white schools, if they go to more affluent schools, that their test scores will go up. And certainly we do have enough consistency to see that there is a, a significant difference from the peers who are back in less resource rich schools. But one of the other things that happens is when those students are in those schools, we still see some rigid and sometimes stagnant differences between groups within the affluent schools because that then allows other factors to start to play themselves out. And we don't see as wide of a gap within the um, opportunity, the schools that are not as opportunity rich across race. So then we have to understand what's going on internally, which leads me back to my other point about the organizational and institutional factors, the environmental factors that may be shaping our realities. So the chickens have come on to roost. This is a, a, what I'm saying now. As we look at our national context in Brazil, in the United States, across the world, we're being forced to think in much more, uh, much greater ways. Racism is not just about, um, you know, um, some, you know, someone saying something nasty to you or having inter prejudice, uh, right? There are some deeply baked dynamics within our organizations and institutions that are also deeply entangled with our economic and resource context that matter. The third and final point, and I'll shut up. One of the things that I'm also thinking about, and for those of you who may have seen the um, New York Times Magazine this past weekend, I read that paper a lot, so I'll apologize for that. But I am starting to think about where it is, again, we haven't gone where our friends and other fields may can help us. And I, am, I realize also that we're not understanding the value of wealth and the resources that are in, embedded within wealth capital. Most of us think about parent education or uh, household income, but the data are starting to show also that wealth matters significantly more than we probably have imagined. And as we all know, there is so little wealth particularly among Black people in our respective societies, um, that we're not comparing, even when we control for socioeconomic status by education, we're still not comparing apples to apples between groups. We're comparing significantly different. It is the case that people like myself, who are highly educated, who come, who have advanced degrees, that on average in the United States, our wealth is less than those who are white with a high school degree. And so when you, you know, so there are some resources that education can actually transmit intergenerationally, but there are also other resources, arguably, that are not transmitted when many of us are only one foot or one generation or less away from poverty. So I think that these are bigger, these other indicators, these are things that it's time for us to think about in our societies from a policy perspective, from an educational perspective, from a social and political perspective, and it's making us uncomfortable. Um, it's pushing us beyond our boundaries, and I and I also think that it's going to, um, you know, in my own research, I'm I'm actually hoping that we'll get away from gap analysis because the gap analysis really shroud um, and in many ways elide the deep systemic kind of historical forces that are at play uh, and that have been into, uh, have been uh, reproduced intergenerationally. So. That's what I, that's how I understand, that's how I, I, where I am now and starting to focus more on the systemic and the institutional and measurement about that too. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and thank you, Martin, for reaching out and asking me to be here. Um, I've been trying to keep up and abreast with what's going on in Brazil in this historical moment and the parallels are similar and they are also quite qualitatively different, but I think we have a lot we can learn from each other. Thanks, Prudence. That's uh, just just great. Just what we'd hoped you would bring to the conversation. So, rather than than trying to summarize or or set the agenda, I think I will open the floor, and uh, um, this is your opportunity now to either ask questions of 
uh, our panelists or uh, comment on your own work or, your, or the issues that you would like to raise. Oh, and bef before, before anyone else speaks, I'd like to welcome Eric Abrams, who's just joined us. And uh, for those of you who don't know him, Eric is the Chief Diversity Officer in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford and uh, um, a friend to all of us, I think. So, and Eric, I don't know if, if, if you would like to say a few words just to introduce yourself um, as we uh, sort of begin the conversation. Certainly, David, and, and thank you for that warm introduction, and I apologize for being late. It's one of those mornings where there are multiple Zooms going on um, on multiple devices. Um, it is good to see all of you. I'm really, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. It's a subject that I'm very curious about. Um, in terms of uh, uh, inclusion and diversity in Brazilian education. Um, I know that a number of us would like to see more diversity in the Brazilian students that we've been successfully able to recruit to the Graduate School of Education. Um, and I'm just looking forward to learning. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Great, well, thanks, Eric. And, and please feel free to pitch in at any point in the conversation. So the floor is open and uh, uh, we sort of welcome questions, comments, discussion. Can, can I start? Yes, please, Barbara. Okay, so thank you, you all for the presentations. And I have a question that is for Prudence, but also encompasses the data that Martin and Ricardo presented. Uh, Prudence, I, I think you have some idea. In Brazil, we had all sort of affirmative actions to try to, you know, close the gap between black and white people, especially in the higher education system. We have some um, quota systems for like make, making, it's not easier for black people to access university, but like making sure we have more black people assessing university in Brazil. And we have some actions at the basic education level, like one enforcement to teach African, Brazilian and African history in the regular curriculum. And I was thinking why we, you were talking about uh, institutional racism and how like this is more than simply individuals, right? There's this systemic layer of racism and how thinking about education and basic education which actions do you think are important? Because despite these policies that we have in Brazil, as Ricardo presented before, the gap continues like across different levels of education. And we see at the school level, like this educational policy to teach African histories from 2003 in Brazil. And we still have a huge gap between black and white students. So it's kind of just enforcing a law is not enough. So which, uh, which would be systemic actions from your perspective that would help to literally f uh, fight racism in the educational system? So I, I'm, I work on the ecology of inequality right now and particularly thinking about it through the prism of racism. It's a multidimensional problem that requires multidimensional solutions. So I can't pinpoint one, let me just say that. Um, the second one is that I think about the context of opportunities. So what are the inputs of the K, of the, the um, higher ed experience? Uh, so when I think here in the US K-12, I think in, in Brazil, uh, thinking about the primary and secondary experiences of students, what are the quality of the teachers? What's, and the quality of the teachers as the research has shown is not just about whether or not they know how to impart their subject matter, but teachers also have to have the relational um, understandings, right? And so you talk about history and curriculum, but are the teachers, what we, what we know here in the United States is the case that many teachers themselves have a lot to learn about how to teach different populations that are not like themselves. That is a really critical problem in American education, and I suspect it is in, in Brazilian education too. The, 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 uh, the second one, the third one is, and I'm going to use this metaphor because it is a really problematic thing in both of our societies, in my opinion, and in, in other societies too. What we have done is that we have kids who are exposed, just bear with me for a moment. There are kids who are on elevators that go at the rate of a bullet speed train. 
There are some who are on escalators that go up and up and up and they're at well coiled, their mechanisms. And then there are some who are on stairwells with missing steps and handrails. And we're telling them all to get to floor 16 or to get to floor 13 at the same time. If they don't, on average, we call it an achievement gap, right? But the real problem is, is the contextual or the ecology of the modes of transportation. So you're not kids, and those on the elevators have so much more in their ecology, including what's in the family. Inequality in here is in the family and the neighborhood and school context. That has to be attended to too, as well. Then you have the kids more in the middle class and the working classes, and some of them through institutional or organizational resources get from the escalators to the, even the elevators. We even have a few kids who will get from the broken stairwells to the escalators or elevators if they get some organizational extra school or nonprofit philanthropic organizations. But on average, in both of our societies, poverty is highly racialized. So that the overwhelming majority in this country, one third, two thirds, I'm sorry, of Black, Latinx, and Native American students are born into poverty or with 100, 150% of poverty in this country. That's problematic. And so to ask them to get to the same level so quickly means that we have to actually attend to macroeconomic and social policies in our society. We have to figure schools are then being asked to adapt to what are some of the resources that are missing from the family household. If parents are not earning as well, healthcare, hungry kids can't learn very well, we know that. So these are the kinds of programs that we know that we have to do. Make sure we're attending to the body as well. The students, affirmative action is such a hot topic, hot button topic. We're dealing with it here in California with the repeal of ACA, the Prop 209, as you know. Listen, I, where do I start with this? Because it's such a historical problem. We all know that affirmative action in the United States started in 1961 when President Kennedy actually passed the first executive order. It was extended to include women. Historically, different groups of people have been ex excluded from opportunities in this society. We've now just boiled it down to a race thing. Okay, so fine, let's go with it. The people who are affected by affirmative action are most likely to be the people who are also putting in a lot of effort and are also on the path to mobility. So what if their scores are not going to be exactly even? So what? I'm a, I'm a, I am a beneficiary of affirmative action in the sense of, I was a, a high achieving student, but maybe my test score didn't meet the average of the test score of the average white kid. Did it mean that I didn't have the competency or the level? I think we have to think more expansively about what it means to be a successful person to be an engaged person, to be, to be someone who's on the mobility track. So I really am, I'm moving away from the test score ideology, which I think we reproduce as re researchers. That metric doesn't tell you a lot about the potential of a person. I know that personally. So um, when we start talking about, well, we still see the gaps, I worry about what we're actually signaling to the world because the gaps can be, the test score gaps can be caused by so many things. The question is, are we looking at people who can be scaffolded, who will be successful and go on to contribute to our nation states? And that's what we need more of. So we're trying to think more broadly here in the state of California, in the, in the nation. And really that competitiveness tends to be around the most uh, elite resources anyway, when we're talking about it. And there's a sense of entitlement from some that we don't wanna compete, we want most of those for ourselves. So that's a whole political matter. But when you ask me about what the policies are, it's multidimensional and it is everything from the school to the family to the neighborhoods. We have to deal with segregation at the meso level, right? And, and the kinds of schools, I mean, I know Brazilian society is also very segregated just like the United States. And then we have to, um, more importantly, critically about the inputs, but the schools can't do it all. So it's got to be the schools in concert with what's going on outside of the schools, in my opinion. Now, this is, where, this is what I'm writing about now. Um, opportunity gaps and gender achievement gaps. So Martin, you wanna comment briefly? Um, well, I just wanted to go um, build on what uh, Prudence and Ricardo said in response to Barbara's question. The problem with 
institutionalized racism is that if you equalize test scores for blacks and whites and you equalize attainment, you would still have a tremendous gap in wealth and a tremendous gap in income. And for particularly for black men. And so the question is, what is it that you do? <laughs> so if you want to keep focusing on education, you're welcome to do that. But the fact is that it's not going to be enough. And it basically, I, if, from the work that I've done and now has been uh, seconded by a newer paper, the big effects have come from fiscal policy programs that equalize access to all resources and basically ferret out, ferret out the discrimination that takes place at every level in the society. I mean, that's basically the this is like the 15th time around for the movement that's taking place in the streets today. And each of these has made an incremental <laughs> effect on, and has had some effect on equalizing uh, access. It has had the least effect on wealth. And Prudence is right. Uh, back in uh, 2000, I participated in a terrific project with people from the University of California, Troy Duster, uh, and others. And I suggest you read that book. It's called Whitewashing Race, because it really focuses on every aspect of this problem. It is a multidimensional problem that goes way beyond schooling and test scores. Test scores are the least important thing. Of course, we d it's very important to fetter out ferret out grade, as Ricardo said, the, the fact that uh, teachers unconsciously or consciously discriminate against black kids. It's important to do that, but its effect on all of that, its effect on the real lives of African Americans is relatively small compared to this other big piece. And so, from a standpoint of social mobilization, the question is, what do you do? Where do you put your money? And to me, you put your money in basically hammering against institutional racism. You just hammer against it at every level until finally people get it. It's all part of the same system. The police are in on it. The capitalists are in on it. They, they want divisions between blacks and white workers because it serves them. It serves them and has served them historically, no matter what they say. You know, Corporation X can do this and that. But the fact is they, by keeping earnings down for workers, they're hurting African-Americans more than they're hurting whites. Thanks, Martin. Other questions or comments? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for, for having this moment for us. I think this is a crucial moment to, to discuss, crucial topic to discuss. And I would love to, to listen to uh, Eric Abrams' uh, comments on, on this uh, thing that I have to ask, which is that, um, so we know that Stanford is a historically white university. Um, yesterday, I just found out that even Cumberly, who was the guy who gave, gave the name for one of the education buildings, is um, has been an eugenic through his his lifetime. There are like um, a bunch of statements from him that classify him as a, as a racist. And, and when I got here, I it's pretty easy to to realize how there is. Uh, a majority of whites here and to me one thing that impresses me when I compare Brazilian and the American history is that in the US the uh, black population is 13 percent of the population and we still see um, 
a considerable amount of black people in positions of power here. Of course, there is inequality, huge inequality, and we cannot even talk about um, like whites do not suffer anything related to race in comparison to blacks. But when I look at Brazil and I see that we have 55% of black people and the, their presence in positions of power is even smaller, I would like to hear your thoughts, Eric, because you have worked as a diversity inclusion office here in Stanford, uh, what you've learned about what works um, and what, what do you think and what were in your experience the, um, the opinions and feelings that black students have inside this university and what have you learned that uh, worked to make their lives um, better in this place and what policies do you think that schools can apply to uh, amplify uh, racial diversity and, and amplify um, black people's voice, black people's power, black people's participation in decision making of places that are historically white as basically every school is in some way in, in Brazil. Hugo, thank you for that question. And I think it's uh, an enormous one um, on many levels, right? And And if I had a brilliant pithy answer that would solve everything, I would give it to you. Unfortunately, I don't. I, I don't think one exists. I think that, um, you know, as, as our Buddhist friends say, there are many paths to enlightenment. I think there are many paths to success um, in terms of making a place like Stanford a welcoming and inclusive place for everyone. Um, I, forgive me for sounding like the crotchety old man, but for a question like this, it's impossible for me not to reflect on what Stanford was like, you know, nearly 40 years ago when I was a freshman. When it's, I'm not saying that we're where we ought to be. I'm not saying that we're where we're going to be. But we're sure of a lot better off than where we were. Um, you know, when, when I was a skinny kid with a lot of hair and thick glasses. Um, I think one of the policies that I think makes the most sense is one that's really about the hardest to do in, in the environment that we're in right now. And that's deep and meaningful uh, uh, interaction, right? Whether it's mentorship, um, whether it's just having somebody you know you can talk to who understands where you're coming from, um, whether it's finding a, a restaurant that serves food that you eat or a church that worships in the way that you worship, being able to find, being able to provide these types of supports for our students, I think is incredibly important. Um, I, I'm also really gratified that you brought up the difference in, um, you know, American, United States American population and the Afro-Brazilian population, right? The, the, the numbers of people of African descent in Brazil um, are seemingly much, much larger. And I think the reasons for why that that, that that group has not ascended to power as much as we might have liked are, are legion. And I don't mean to present myself as any expert in Brazilian history. What I can say is I think that one of the things fortunate or unfortunate that our countries have in common is that often the, the black people who are most prominent in the popular culture are athletes and entertainers. Um, you know, whether it's, it's, it's Neymar or Michael Jordan, right? Everybody in the world knows who those two people are. Um, I would love to be able to, to, to find a way to amplify the successes of people, you know, somewhere there's a great COVID researcher who's of African descent in Brazil, right? But I don't know who that is. I would love to be able to know who that is and amplify that. Does that make sense? Um, and provide students with examples of, you know, you can do it too. Yes, this person, you know, somebody like you has achieved this type of success. Perfect. Thank you so much. Can I ask Google what were those percentages that you threw out? The, so you said the, fifty-five percent the were. The Brazilian Geographical uh, Statistics Institute, the BGE, they used to combine what we call the pardos and pretos. Yeah, so, so you said that's about fifty-five percent. Negros together are fifty-five percent. Yeah. 
It's a, probably a little bit less. Than, it depends. If you look at descendants, it's actually sixty. Yeah, this is a big this is a big debate, right? That the, but what for num sure, what number like, did you use for you constants, intervals, and whatever we have at least half of our population. Yeah. And what number do you use for U.S.? Thirteen. Thirteen is probably. It depends. Descendants are probably a lot larger. <laughs> no, it's 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 a for, uh, it's how you identify yourself as. This is the data that I know. Well, right now the the, the word the tar they're saying forty million people of, of African de of, of descendants of slaves are in the U.S. So um, that's roughly thirteen. Um, yeah, yeah, about thirteen percent. That's what you're saying about forty million. But I, I actually think when we compare the two, this is why it's always been so fascinating to me is um, in terms of the comparative analysis of the two, is that Brazil's uh, population of people of African descent, particularly those who were brought over to be enslaved, um, was 10 times greater than the US. And that's been, that's a, it's a fascinating thing to then see. I mean, obviously um, the history also shows that Brazil was the last to abolish uh, slavery as well. Um, you know, some 30, what, 33 years later. But I think the biggest thing has to do with the ladders of mobility and how strict those ladders want. So go back to the affirmative action thing. I mean, we had Jim Crow in the United States up until the 1950s and 60s. One of the reasons affirmative action had to be implemented was to try to uh, speed up the doors of access because of the rigidity of things like Jim Crow and the exclusionary tactics to anything from employment, to political power, even voting. Um, and that did build a, a middle class in this country. So it's important also, I don't know, maybe you know, Martin, it's not as big, but there is about, a, yeah, I say about probably about 5% or more, uh, maybe 30% of African-Americans are solidly middle class in the United States. Um, we don't tend to talk about that because we racialize poverty so and we blacken it. Um, but if, if it weren't for those policies in the 1960s, we would not have gotten as um, great of a, a middle class in this country, even that. I, wouldn't, I don't know what the size of comparatively is in Brazil, but it was affirmative action that did help to facilitate the building of a black middle class. Ricardo, I, I know you had a couple of slides uh, at the end of that policy, so I just want to make sure that you get a chance to. Uh, yeah, if you have something yeah. To say about yeah. I'd like just to make some comments here. And can you hear me? Are you guys yes. hearing me? Okay. Yeah. Then I can show you some of the figures that I want because I think that they are related somehow with some stuff that Prudence brought here. So you know, I, I completely agree uh, with Prudence Hill that you know racism is something you know, very complex and is deeply ingrained in our society and it's very, you know, it's a multidimensional issue. And when we are doing like this quantitative research, as you know, somehow we are not capturing all the complexity of the, these gaps that are here. So, you know, we have to have in mind that even when we, you know, we are equalizing uh, you know, blacks and white on the stuff that we can observe, there are still like lots of difference there on stuff that we cannot observe that are very meaningful on the life of these people. So that's very clear, for instance, in Brazil, you know, uh, where social networks something very important for your success, right? These people are connected to di completely different social networks. You know, like in Brazil is a very unequal country, much more than US, and that also plays a very important role, right? If you don't have, you know, if you don't have connections in the upper society, it's very hard for you to do well uh, in life. So that's just one example of this multidimensionality issue that we don't capture with our data. So I just want to show something. Uh, this is something, some stuff very new that I'm working on that are gaps on social economic, uh, uh, social emotional abilities. And I think that are very interesting and is related with this stuff that we are talking here. So, can you guys see my slides? Yes. Okay, so let me just show something here. Uh, so, this is racial inequality in social emotional skills. So, this is kids on, these are seventh grade and ninth, ninth grade. So these are just differences on all these 
social emotional dimensions. So I'm just showing you to see things that are behind data, the, you know, the test for data stuff that normally we don't see. So these are huge differences in terms of, you know, all, in all these measures, self-esteem, self-efficacy, self-control. So these measures, they are not only important for school progress and success in life, but they are also important for the own welfare of someone, you know. Being good, uh, you know, being well with yourself, it's very good for your welfare. You know, it's not something that's important for other outcomes. It's an outcome of interest uh, in itself, right? So, you know, so all these black kids, they are lagging, really lagging behind on, on these attributes. So then you can say, oh, but this is not so important, right, for uh, in terms of uh, objective outcomes. So when, so this I'm looking to the predictive power of social emotional skills uh, against uh, test scores. So these are all kids that in 2011 were in the seventh grade, in the seventh grade, right? And now I'm just breaking the sample. So I can follow, using administrative data, I can see where these kids are like seven, where they went uh, seven years after that, right? So I'm just breaking the data and on where these kids were after the, at the time has uh, passed. So what you can see is that the kids that were like, uh, lagging behind, you know, the, the ones that are going on the diagonal are the ones that are actually, you know, uh, following the, the right uh, progression. The ones that are below the diagonal are the ones that are actually, you know, that are lagging behind. So the left, the right bar here is social emotional skills. The middle bar is math and the left bar is reading. So as you can see, like social emotional skills are really important. It's a very power, uh, you know, has a very uh, pr uh, strong predictive power in terms of school success and school progression. So just, you know, so I, I could get two kids that have like exactly the same standard you know, the same standardized test scores. And they would be still having like social, uh, social emotional skills that are very different. And as I said, they are relevant itself. You know, they have their own value, but also they are very relevant for uh, a school uh, progress. So, you know, I think that this type of work is very useful, but I, co I completely agree with Prudence that, you know, we. You know, even, I mean, when you have data on that, that, that doesn't tell the whole story, you know, because this is about, you know, the type of life that these people have and the type of life that they endure. And as we know, I mean, it's a completely different life experience from a black. When you compare like a life experience of an alpha black and a white guy, it's completely different. And we don't have measure to capture all these differences. But still, I think that's very important to look to this data to think of, you know, what are the, first, I mean, to understand the differences in the things that we can measure. That's very important. You know? But also, uh, I think that's also very important uh, to think about policies, right? We have like a whole uh, option of policies and we really have to think about what are the expected goals of these different policies. Because, you know, we must, we must get it right. But in order to know that we are getting them right, we need like to have some objective measures or at least, or at least we have to measure uh, the stuff that we can that are at least, you know, uh, that to guarantee that on the stuff that we can measure, that we believe that are important, we are actually reaching uh, our goals. Thank you, Ricardo. Ricardo, may I ask a question? Sure. And, and, and I'm, I'm asking this from a position of, of, of ignorance. Um, this may be something that you've already uh, figured in, but I'm wondering if your measures of things like self-efficacy and self-efficacy and self-control or self-esteem kind of point back to what I would consider to be a Eurocentric model. And might there be a way to get at questions, um, to ask questions that would show that a, a, a kid with a poorer background might have greater self-esteem, you know, maybe a question about 
how good are you at helping your family getting the things they need or, or, or some things that would, you know, stress the, the contributions of a young poor kid to their family that a middle class or a wealthier kid might not make contributions like that. And their self-esteem might show much higher if those questions were asked. I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but I, I hope that's understandable. No, no, you, you are make, making completely sense. Uh, so, you know, when I look, of course, that makes sense. I mean, maybe the model that's there is like, uh, you know, it's a model that was designed for a white or a typical white kid and, and not designed for a, a black kid. And they are, they are like in very different environments. So a self-esteem for a black kid might be very different. The way that they express it might be very different than from a white kid. So these are all international measures that are used by, you know, international valid. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, since these differences are actually, they show everywhere that might be picking up some of this. But again, I mean, what, what, I, what I think that's very important here, I wouldn't be concerned about this if these measures wouldn't be predicting, uh, you know, uh, any type of uh, objective outcome. But when I look at these graphs and I, I see that these measures, they predicted more uh, school progress than proficiency in math or proficiency in reading, then I see, you know, this is, you know, I'm capturing something that's very relevant. And in this stuff that's very relevant, the blacks are lagging behind. And maybe you're right that, you know, the, the goal of the policy here is not to do like uh, blacks and, and, and whites to perform equally in those measures because they reflect some uh, cultural difference between them that we don't want actually to be the same, right? But still, uh, this is measuring something uh, that the blacks are, are really like behind and seems to be very important for school progress. So I don't see this as, you know, a goal or something that really have, you know, the, the objective of a policy should be uh, to make blacks and uh, whites to perform equally on those measures. But still, it's very worrisome to know, uh, to know that there is like this sort of soft skills that seems to be very relevant for progress in school and, and that blacks are not actually, they're not performing well on, on those uh, elements, on, on those measures. So but, Leo has a question. Yeah, oh, let me, cool. So, uh, thank you all for the presentation. I have a question maybe uh, for you, David, and also Martin, but mainly for uh, Eric Abrams. Uh, I think Eric, Eric mentioned at the beginning that uh, the Lehman Center doesn't have a lot of black students. And it's hard to see black students around here at the GSC, especially coming from the Lehman Center. I mean, Eric, uh, what do you think could be good approach or measures to improve that, right? So I feel we kind of have uh, this mission in the Lehman Center to talk about inequality and diversity and everything, but I feel we need to start to thinking about this stuff, you know, achieve a uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I'd, I'd love to, to hear some suggestions. I, I agree wholeheartedly, Leo, and that's what I was trying to get at in my, when I first answer when I said that I think one of the things that would be most effective is something we can't do right now, and that's be there. Um, I think that if we had a number of our, our faculty members and even a couple of our alumni who are in Brasilia, and, and perhaps me, I'd love to come back. It's been a, a number of years since I've been in Brazil. Um, visiting schools, talking to, to students who might be thinking about careers in education. And that might, be, that might include visiting students younger than we would usually think about for a graduate school of education. You know, um, it's wonderful if somebody's 24 or 25 and wants to come to Stanford, but if they don't speak English at all at that point, it's going to be very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. But to get to the point where we can communicate, you know, 
maybe with, with, with younger students and certainly with students who are, are in college and say, you know, we want you, we've got a place for you, we might even have some financial assistance for you, and this is what we're about and we've got people like you, I, I think that could start to move, move the proverbial needle. And, and I will say, Leo, and, I, and some of you know this, um, Deborah Lorenzo is on the call and uh, um, some of our alumni students, friends have joined. Yeah, sure with us to actually recruit students for the first time. You know, in the Lemon Center, we have never engaged in active recruitment. We've waited for people to come to us. Yeah. And the consequence of this, as Ricardo pointed out, is that we have tapped a single social network, which is probably um, not exclusively, but almost exclusively white and middle class. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and those are, those are the people who naturally sort of come to Stanford. So for the first time, we're, we're engaged in an active recruitment process. Eric is helping us with this. Um, and we are seeking ways to reach out to different groups in Brazil, different networks uh, that will let people know about the opportunities that are available at the Lemon Center and that we hope will uh, lead to the development of strategies that help us to overcome some of the obstacles that are in the way of poor and uh, black students in Brazil, especially language. Um, because, you know, again, middle-class Brazilians learn English as a second language, almost from the cradle. Um, and, you know, black Brazilians don't have those opportunities. And, and that's, that's a huge obstacle for students who want to study in the United States. So figuring out ways to address that, as Eric says, early in the process, so that when uh, students become reach the point where they could come to the Lemon Center, they're, they're, they're prepared for it. Deborah, I don't know if you want to, to, to talk at all about what we're doing or, or how it's going. Yeah, I, um, hi everyone and hi Leah, your personal friend, so good to see you. Um, so I've been working, there's a, a grupo de trabalho, a work group that is, has been discussing for the past I don't know, has it been two months already? Uh, two or three months, uh, how we can get the Lemon Center to reflect more of the diversity that we see in Brazil. Um, I joined because why not? I care and because I'm black and it just made sense. Um, but we've been discussing ways, like I had a meeting with Christina yesterday to try and get the information to people. And again, as someone just said was it David uh, in earlier than usual in, in the sense or maybe it was Eric but just um, like and that's something that I, I've, I, I join also because that's something I do on my part-time I'm a volunteer um, college advisor uh, trying to get people into college in the US and sometimes graduate school as well and that's the main difference when I work with my white students we work with them like they're ready, they come, they apply, they go. When I work with black students, it's about convincing them that they can do it, tracing a plan for two or three years of language study, and then three or four years later, supporting them as they apply, as they raise the funds to apply, and then apply, and then hopefully figuring out how they get the scholarships. So it is a, a medium to long-term plan, but it's definitely feasible. And as I think Prudence mentioned before, this is an issue that requires actually multiple fronts. We're not gonna solve inequality by getting a handful of black presidents to Stanford. Um, but it is, uh, it's, it's part of the process. We can't champion um, equality if when we look at our own ranks, everyone or almost everyone is white or middle-class or from the same states in Brazil. Um, that's that bothered me um, when I was at Stanford um, and I'm really grateful to see that there's a movement towards changing that for the future generation of Lemon Fellows that will join. Can I, can I jump in um, because I, I think this is a really interesting moment um, particularly as institutions are making a lot of symbolic moves um, to show that they care and are trying to also um, instrumentally change what the demographics look like um, in some ways. 
Um, I'm thinking about Ricardo's uh, last presentation about the social psychological outcomes and um, esteem and efficacy and such. And thinking about the wider ecology about where people get their messages about where they belong or how they are valued by a society or an organization. And we already know, we know from the research increasingly that um, students also outcomes are so affected by uh, seeing people who look like them or who share similar backgrounds that match really matters in terms of feeling like you belong or you're included. It, that match actually helps to recruit, which is another reason why we have to have people who are Black at every level of the organization. Um, it's a recruitment tool too. Um, it does not mean tokenism. This is the problem with elite but white universities. They've, I have for 30 years have been a token, a one of two in just about every sphere. It's time to get past that ceiling. Um, this is also why we have to widen the pipeline, which means that in the, the, what widening the, the pipeline helps to, re, helps to actually expand the, 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 the recruitment. The, in, in the actual um, acceptance rates, even once you recruit, you don't necessarily get students to come. Why would I wanna go there versus this other place, which looks a little bit more like me, which feels like culturally, it may be more like me, or socially, it would be more like me. So there are also multiple levels about what we do. We can expand access and even offer more financial aid and say, hey, you're welcome here. But if you don't do the secondary work, which has to be concomitant as well, which is also about this, uh, the sense of belonging and inclusion, which is more intangible, a little bit harder. It's about the face you put on, on the programs. It's about the networks, as you said. Um, but I can't imagine, I mean, in the wider society, uh, self-esteem is going to be assaulted if beauty is, a tie to, is tied to whiteness, right? if success is tied to whiteness. You don't see yourself in the newspapers, on the televisions, as the successful ones. You only see yourself in a kind of a stereotypical way. Stereotype threat does permeate every social domain in our society too. So I can, so one of the things, Ricardo, I'm not disagreeing with you. I just wanna be clear about it. I do struggle with our framing though. And our framing tends to say the racial, look at the social, even in social psychological ways, we, we who are black, those of us who are black, we are also lower on it. It creates a kind of a deficiency or deficit analysis, which is not placing the onus on the institutional forces, the media as an institution. You know, educational institutions, our institutions are inherently racist. I got my chancellor to say that right, say that the other day. We have to accept that our institutions are racist. Look at what they've not done. They have not moved the needle much in 50 years. We have to accept that. And now it is a transformative moment for us to move past that ceiling, because it was indeed a ceiling, and to burst it. To ex it needs to just explode. And we have to be much more intentional about it. So this is why when people talk about affirmative action, it is affirmative to say, I'm going to be proactive. That's what I mean about affirmative action. It is affirmative to say that I'm going to invest more resources. I'm going to put different kinds of people. I'm going to share these elite spaces. That's affirmative action to me. It's not to narrow it down and say we're just taking, we're taking less inferior, less capable, or competent people. That's not affirmative action. So I just, it's an ecological problem. Again, we have to think about the inclusion um, as well. And so I, I just want to put that out there because all of that has an impact on outcomes. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go because I've been <laughs> for another meeting. I thank you all for, for including prudence, me in all the prudence best Prudence, before, prudence, before you leave. Yeah. I would like to second what you said. <laughs> and I just want to, and I want to thank you for joining us, Prudence. I know, I mean, deans have a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot of responsibilities. Well, and really, I'm really grateful to you for taking the time. My pleasure. So all the best you. to you. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Martin. I've, I've, I've believed for a long time that, that any student, but, but certainly for a student from, from any disadvantaged background, really needs three things to succeed at, a, at an elite place like Stanford. Um, one of them is a grown-up that you can trust. 
whether that's a faculty member, a staff member, it can be somebody who works on the grounds crew. It doesn't matter what their role is, if they know something about how the university works and there's someone you can trust. Yeah. I think you need to fall in love with something in the mind, right? Inside the life of the mind, which is not hard for graduate students, right? That's why they come to graduate school. But I also think that students need to fall in love with something outside of the mind. And I think that's where we often fall short with failing students, um, whether it's, um, you know, African-American students, Afro-Brazilian students, Latinx students, Native American students, what, what have you, is that thing outside of the classroom that you fall in love with, exactly. whether it's the you know, a club, an extracurricular activity. Maybe it's a group of friends. Um, I, I feel that I was honestly incredibly fortunate. I mean, I, I came to Stanford in the early 80s from inner city Chicago and, you know, didn't know any, but I'd never even seen the campus um, except in childhood. But I fell in with a group of friends and a group of people who really like, like to do some goofy theater stuff. And I had this group of people who were not going to let me fail. Um, I, academic advisors, peers, that, that it was just, it became a very comfortable place for me. And I had friends, dear friends to this day who were like, I don't know why you love Stanford so much, man. It was awful for me. It was like, it was great for me. And, and one of the things that I want to do desperately is try to help people have experiences that were almost as strong as mine, mine was. I want to I give you, there's a double Martin, whammy here. Martin, sorry, I, can I interrupt you? I, I, we're out of time. Um, so, and I'd really like to just, if there's anyone other than the presenters who would like to make a closing comment, I'd welcome that. Is that one of the presenters or? No, you're, you're, the floor is yours. I, I would, I would love to, uh, invite everyone and, and, and mainly, all the white, uh, white folks that are here for us to commit ourselves to keep studying about this issue, keep studying about anti-racism, because we might be experts in our areas. Of course, I'm, I'm only 22, so I'm not expert in anything still, but we should, the only way that things will change in the long term is if we commit ourselves to studying and to learning, because this is not a new topic, but we are really, really embedded in the structure that blind ourselves to, to the problem. So I think that if we really want to change, we should. And in Brazil today, the main nonfiction book, uh, the bestseller nonfiction book is a book called uh, the manual, uh, an anti-racist manual for, uh, by Djamila Ribeiro. So it's time, it's now, so let's do it. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll treat that as the benediction. Thank you, uh, um, uh, thank you, Hugo. And, and this is not to end the conversation, those of you who want to stay, and uh, Martin, I, I, sorry for cutting you off, but uh, we, we can continue the conversation, but uh, I do recognize that uh, people do have other commitments besides the seminar, so. I, I just wanted to thank uh, Eric and Ricardo for taking their time to participate. Um, it's, it's been a terrific discussion. Prudence also, and she's not here, but um, all of you contributed enormously uh, to the discussion. Really, thank you for doing it. Very, it's, it's worth having something like this repeatedly. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very, very deep well that we're in here. <laughs> No, and I, it doesn't, you don't cover it in an hour and a half. But it, it's been I, I agree, Martin. And I think, you know, we talk about a moment, you know, we're in a moment, you know, where Black Lives Matter is, you know, on everyone's lips and, and there's a growing awareness among white people that racism is real and it's systemic and it's not just in your heart, but in, in your life. Um, but we don't want that to be a moment, right? I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we sustain that? recognition, that acknowledgement, um, and begin to commit ourselves in new ways to, to making a change and not just to, to, to understanding it better. So I, I wanna add my, add my thanks to all of you. And uh, um, yes, I agree that, that this, this is a conversation that must go on. And the one, the one practical thing that I will say, just, just uh, you know, as, we, as we talked about briefly, um, 
uh, Rodrigo, Deborah, Christina, I, uh, Tatiana, um, have all been part of this uh, working group um, on student recruitment. And if you have ideas for us or uh, networks that we can tap into or uh, would simply like to participate in the work of uh, expanding the pool of candidates for uh, students and fellows in the Lemon Center, um, please talk to one of us and we will welcome your, welcome your support. <laughs>